chapter 3 and verse 14 is where we'll be today. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. I'll begin by reading that for us. In Ephesians 3, 14, Paul writes, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is a rich prayer or prayer report from Paul. This is what he was praying for the church at Ephesus. This is, in many ways, uh, a continuation of the prayer that was back in chapter 1 that we discussed a few weeks ago. And here he's, he's really praying for them to experience the love of Christ. That they would have strength to understand and to see, to experience what the love of Christ truly is. I was thinking, when reflecting on this topic of love, I was thinking what it's like to see the blossoming of a, of a new relationship. Uh, when I was a teenager, uh, my youth group was the kids that I went to this smaller Christian school with as well. And out of our roughly 20-some person youth group, I believe that seven marriages took place. And so there was couples that were formed from that youth group, and many are still together. Uh, my wife and I met uh, throughout our childhood, and we're in youth group together and married. But I had the ability to witness the blossoming of these new relationships as a teenager, and it was interesting to see the reorganization of priorities when one of these young boys would find a young girl that they were interested in. I, I would play basketball with my friends, and then one day, one of my friends was not interested in playing basketball or hanging out. It was kind of annoying, actually. So we'd be left shorthanded, and then perhaps others would, and then ultimately, I too would forsake playing basketball on lunch or breaks to hang out with my now wife. And so you see a reorganization of priorities, and that's kind of a, a silly example, but when, when love enters the mix, perhaps you've seen uh, the beauty of, of people embodying the love of Christ in others, right? We have examples of uh, even, even these Wacky Wednesday cards that we can hand out. We have an opportunity to put hands and feet to the love of Christ by sharing the gospel, by inviting kids out so that way we can minister to them and have fun with them and ultimately teach them the gospel. Or those who have recently went out and ministered at a place like Youth Haven, right? For a work day, this is another example of how you can People have embodied the love of Christ, or Camp Sela, or, or some of these recent work days. By preparing a place for people, for kids, to come and learn about Christ. There was an example that I remember in the late, kind of 90s, while I was a kid. There was a man who, who was rooted and grounded in Christ's love, in many ways. And he would spend his Thursday nights and his Saturdays visiting kids in the area, and there was a small kind of bus route that he had going in the Owasso area. And he would share the gospel with kids. He would visit them. He would invite them. 
He would, at times, share food, give food to the kids. And time and time again, he would go out on his Thursday nights and on his Saturdays in the heat and in the rain and in the cold. Often kind of a thankless position, ministering to people who did not have the ability to give back. And a young girl, roughly in the eighth grade at the time, was invited. And she began attending and became friends with those in the youth group. And the gospel was shared with her and she trusted Christ and became a follower of his. And this man's embodying the love of Christ, he and his wife and and others, resulted in somebody seeing the true love of Christ for them. And this young who was a young girl now, is a lady who is married to a pastor and does the same. She shares the gospel. She gives of her time and effort for those who are less fortunate, and she shares the love of Christ with them. And so we seek to embody the love of Christ. The love of Christ is something that we read often about, that we sing about this morning, and we we pray for it, and we long for it, and we want to better understand it. And this is the heart that Paul shares in this passage. We desire as a church to see Christ's love for us over and over again. So if there's one prayer for the church that that I would pray today and that many of our elders and pastors have also mentioned to me that they are praying, it's that God would grant us the strength to comprehend better the love of Christ. So let's take a moment and let's just pray that now. Father, Lord, we we come before you. Lord, you truly are the one who resides above, Lord, all people. You are the one who, Lord, everyone who names the name of Christ is named by your name. And you are rich in love and mercy and grace. And God, we want to understand that. Lord, we need your spirit to be at work in us. To do what words can't. We need your spirit through your word to speak to us. To encourage us, to help us to better comprehend the incomparable expanse of your love. Help us, Father, we pray for your glory. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to answer kind of three questions as how we'll discuss this passage. We want to know why does Paul pray? What does Paul pray for? And then why does Paul praise at the end? Because we have this prayer in the, in the first five or six verses here, and then we have this doxology of of praise that Paul gives as well. So why does Paul pray? Well, this passage starts out with the phrase, for this reason. It's always helpful when you're looking uh, in God's word or when you're talking to somebody and they say, I do that for this reason, to know what the reason is. And so there's many reasons and there's many um, attempts people have made or Uh, discussions that people have had over what these reasons are. There's several of them. But this is something that he says at the beginning of the chapter as well. He says, for this reason. I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ, he says in in verse 1 of chapter 3. And then he kind of discusses being a prisoner of Christ. And then in verse 14, he says, for this reason again. So what is... The reason, well, I think it goes back to chapter 2, a big part of this. He says in chapter 2, verse 12, remember that you were at, were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you were once, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, 
and that he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross. And he says, for this reason I pray in this passage. So what is the reason? Because he now has access to God. That wall of hostility between him and God has been broken down through Christ's blood and he now has access to go before the throne of God. So what's the reason he prays? Because he can pray. That's one. That's kind of basic. That, that seemed like a little bit of a cop-out. What's the reason he prays? Because he can. But that's, that's much of the point in chapter 2. Because he has access to God the Father, why would we not pray if we have access to God? Paul was also praying because God is rich and powerful and able to strengthen. He says this in verse 8 of chapter 3. That God, that there are unsearchable riches of Christ, he says, and that he was given those to proclaim. But he also says that in this passage, in verse 16, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power. That he's praying to God because God is the one who is able to accomplish what needs to be done. He's praying to God because he's in the family of God with the Ephesians. That's another thing. That in Ephesians 3, 15, this next verse here, it says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. He talks about, in the previous chapters as well, about him uh, being adopted with the Ephesians and that they are now Christ's. So Paul was praying because he's in the family of God with Ephesians. He's he's praying for them because they are family with him. They are close to him. They are those for whom he loves, that he thinks often about and that he cares for. He would have spent a significant amount of time with them, and you can read in Acts how emotional his departure was from them, and so he's praying for them because they are his family, and he cares for them. Another, as we look at that verse 15, it says, for, from whom every family on heaven and on earth is named. I did just want to, it kind of seems, there's two ways to take that phrase, from whom every family on, um, in heaven and on earth is named. It can either mean exactly how it's translated in the ESV, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. And that kind of speaks to God being the giver of life. He's the father over all things. But I think probably what it means a little bit clearer is from whom the whole family on heaven and on earth, in heaven and on earth is named. That every can also be translated and is in other places in Ephesians translated as the whole or all. And so what I believe it's referring to is that all those who are under, who have been adopted by Christ, who are under his Um, lordship who have repented, who believe and trust in him in heaven and on earth, those who are called by his name, those who have been adopted by him as it talked about in Ephesians chapter 1, it seems to be talking about them. So Paul is praying for them because he is family with them. He cares about them. There's a love for them. So he's praying because he has access to God. He's praying because God is able to do something. God is rich. He's praying because God is Father. And he's praying because in verse 13, he says, So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering. Paul's praying for them because he doesn't want them to lose heart, he doesn't want them to grow discouraged. As mentioned before, they were probably a smaller community in the shadow of a a large community. A large community of people who did not name the name of Christ, who were not believers, and and that was a place where you could often get discouraged if you're outnumbered. And so he's praying for them because he does not want them to lose heart, and you can really look at this whole prayer under that idea of encouragement if you're losing heart. If you were to do that, you wouldn't, The way that you would see it, I guess, is that you you won't lose heart when you see that your heavenly Father is rich, as it says in verse 16. 
You won't lose heart when you see that Christ's spirit dwells within you. You won't lose heart when you grasp the immense love that Christ freely gives to you in verse 18. You won't lose heart when you believe that to know Christ is to possess everything. You won't lose heart when you grasp the goodness of God. Talks about in verse 20. And you won't lose heart when your greatest joy is in the glory of God. Verse 21. And so you could look at this whole passage through the lens of Paul is praying for them to be encouraged. In perhaps a discouraging time and place. And so if you're discouraged, or if you know somebody who is, this is a great prayer to pray for them. But this is, the reasons Paul prays here is why we pray. We pray because we have access and because God is able to work and does work. We pray for one another because we dwell in the family of God together. And we pray for others who are outside the family of God because we want them to be a part of it as well. We pray because we don't want to lose heart in the midst of life. We don't want our love and joy to fade. We don't want to... We pray because we want to see the love of Christ with fresh eyes. These are all reasons why we should and do pray. And again, you know, I happen to, in my preaching in Ephesians, I've preached on both the prayers, which just kind of happened to work out that way. But again, just like the prayer in Ephesians chapter 1 that Paul prayed, he's praying strictly for their spiritual condition, that they would know and love and grasp the love of Christ. So this is why Paul is praying. But for what is Paul praying? Paul is praying that the Ephesians would be strengthened with power. And the power is not just a a physical strength. It's a spiritual strength is what he's praying for. It's a supernatural strength. In verse 16, he says that they would be strengthened with power. And in verse verse 18, to comprehend the love of Christ. So Paul is is praying for them to understand something, but beyond that, he's praying for them to experience the love of Christ that can only come through the work of the Spirit in a person's life. It's interesting, you guys, if you've read this passage, you can see the Trinity clearly in this passage. In verse 14, he says that he's praying to the Father In verse 16, he says that you would have power through the Spirit. In verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts. What a comfort and an encouragement it should be to us that all members of the Trinity, when we pray, are actively engaged in answering your prayer, in demonstrating the love of Christ to you, that that all members of the Trinity here are active. It's interesting, the timing of this prayer is, is when he shifts from, he had been kind of mainly teaching a little bit more clearly deep doctrine and the blessings of God in chapters 1 through 3, but in chapters 4 through 6, he's going to get really practical. He's going to say, be gentle, be patient. Children, obey your parents. Husbands, love your wives. Right? These are things that he's going to get really practical with. And it's like before he gets really practical, he's praying that the, the Spirit will help them. The Spirit will help them as they seek to walk in the Spirit. So what is Paul praying specifically? He's, he's praying that they'd be strengthened with power through the Spirit in your inner being. This is really interesting that he would pray for it in your inner being. What is he talking about there? But this is where the Spirit works. The Spirit works in your heart. Where others can't often see, can't often get to, can't often help. That place where when you're alone with your own thoughts and you're perhaps struggling or joyful or whatever the case may be, that's where the Spirit works in those quiet moments that the Spirit is at work, showing the love of Christ. You know, I've learned through some counseling more, but 
through my own interactions as well. Those quiet moments when you're alone just with yourself. What do you think of God? What do you think of life? What are your fears? What are your hopes? What are your hopes that will never come to pass? It's in the quietness of our heart, our inner being, that the Holy Spirit works. It makes him different from all other people in our life who they can speak to us and we can internalize, but the Holy Spirit strengthens us in our inner being. And this is what God had promised in Ezekiel that he put our spirit within us. In Romans, he said, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Holy Spirit which dwells within you. 1 Corinthians said, do you not know you're a temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? And then he goes on to say and to point out in verse 17 that he says with power through his spirit that you would be strengthened in verse 17 he said so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith many of you have wondered where the popular statement ask Jesus into your heart has came from right this is probably from this verse where that's most commonly said many of the people like uh, you know John the Baptist said repent and believe, and that's probably the most common thread. And, but there is this statement of asking Jesus into your heart that some people will ask or mention, and we kind of get what they mean by that. They mean repentance and faith. But they probably get it from this passage. It's that those who have faith in Christ, Christ dwells within them through his spirit. Christ dwelling in your heart through faith is the greatest reality a person could know. As a people, we were made to bring glory to God. And perhaps if you're here today and you're wondering, what's this idea of Christ dwelling in my heart? This is foreign to me. I'm a little unsure. Maybe it's something that you had heard about in Sunday school or something as a kid. But this is really a, a short item that's often said to summarize the gospel. That as a people... We were made to bring glory to God. That's why we were created. That's why you were created. But going back to the garden, we instead used our breath to curse God. So we owe him. The judgment is give him your breath back. You've rejected him. There's condemnation that sits on those who have sinned against God. Our hands which, we, which he formed to serve him we used to destroy our tongues which he made in his image to sing his praise. We've cursed man and God and our, our eyes made to behold his goodness have run in search for other joys and our ears formed to hear his truth. We've listened to our own ideas. Our minds given to comprehend his love we've instead used towards the end of evil, evil imagination and vain purposes. Because of our opposition to his design we stand before his wrath. He is God. He can judge us however he pleases. We are not God. And just to let us go free from punishment would be to compromise his own justice so he would be justified in allowing us to be destroyed. Yet he chose another way. God chose to absorb his wrath through Christ and allows those who ask for forgiveness, who, who come to him, who run to Christ, he offers them eternal peace with God. What greater reality could there be for a person than to, by the Spirit's power, see their need for a Savior and to comprehend the love of Christ that he's poured out on them? So Paul prays that, they would, that Christ would dwell in their hearts through faith and that they would be rooted and grounded in love Once the Savior has gripped you, there is no other joy that appeals. We, we send roots down deep into Christ's love for us. 
Perhaps you've at times desired something so bad that it seemed it would solve all of your problems if you had it. If you just had a new vehicle to replace the old broken down one, you just had a new house to replace the current situation. I have lived with my parents for 295 days. <laughs> I have reevaluated some life decisions during that time. What led us to this place? My parents have been amazing. But from our move from Oregon to Michigan, we have now lived there for 295 days. And it has seemed in my own mind like this, a house, our own place, would solve so many problems. And perhaps there's some things that it would definitely make easier. But there is only one truth that solves our deepest problem in life. And it was so deep a problem that we could really summarize it clearly by saying it's all your problems. The one truth is Romans 5.8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We want to be rooted and grounded in that love. It's life-orienting. When you grasp that you have God's approval through Christ, you realize you don't need anybody else's approval. You don't have to act a certain way to garner attention or dress a certain way. You don't have to be a certain thing to get people's approval. Man's approval becomes worth far less. Not that you don't love or care for people, but you're no longer living for that approval in life. You have Christ. When you grasp that you have the greatest treasure, peace with God, your desire for other treasures will fade. It just won't matter quite as much. When you realize God's providential will is your inheritance, you'll see your circumstances of life as given from God. Just imagine how life-altering that would be. If every circumstance that you face this week, you seen as allowed from a loving God. Allowed from a loving God is making you more like Christ. Every circumstance you face this week. The traffic, the dog that chewed up your parents' couch that now you have to replace. If you've seen everything through that lens, that this was allowed by a loving God who's making me more like Christ. That's really the essence of Romans 8.28. All things work together for good. And he continues to pray. He says that you might have strength to comprehend the expanse of God's love for you. He mentions its breadth. Its breadth that reaches as wide as the heavens. Its length. It's never ending. His love for you will never fail. It will never cease. Its height, it reaches high and it exalts our king. Its depth, it's as deep as God himself can reach. It's sacrificial. And that it's when we understand the expanse of Christ's love for us that we are filled with the fullness of God. And this is really, I think, if, if you were to summarize briefly what Paul is praying. He is praying that you will be filled with the fullness of God. He is praying for the Ephesian church that they will be filled with the fullness of God. What does this idea mean of the fullness of God? Of being filled with the fullness of God I think the clearest explanation is that there would be nothing in your life that is not touched by the reality of God's love for you. One person said that God's love for you would fill every nook and cranny of your life. That you would see everything through the lens of God's love for you. 
The analogy given in Ephesians 1, like I mentioned, is adoption. And I was thinking about this idea of adoption. And if we were to consider a child who was left hungry and alone, destitute and without, born apart from the love of others. We picture this child orphaned. And then we picture a family who has taken this child into their home and welcomed them as one would their own and adores this child. They become their precious child. We love the idea of a cherished and adored child that was without. And as that child grows up with the love that it has from these new parents, there is no aspect of that child's life that will not be marked and touched by the deep love of their father. Everything that that child does will will now be marked, will be formed by the adoption that they've had through Christ because their life would be totally and radically different had they not been adopted by him. So where have there are places where you have not allowed Christ's very nature to impact. Right? We do this in simple ways like one thing we'll do is hide sin. We'll refuse to acknowledge shortcomings. But if we allow the love of Christ to inform that, why would we hide sin? We've been forgiven by God. We can run to God. He has deep love for us. Why would we refuse to acknowledge shortcomings? We should run to him. He is a gracious and merciful father. We think of the story of the prodigal son. The son who said, give me my inheritance. I'm going to go take off. And he takes off and he blows it all and he spends it. I had a friend that I used to pastor with who would quickly, um, lovingly, kindly, he would reprimand anybody who called it the parable of the prodigal son. Because that's not the point. It's the parable of the merciful father. The father who waited. Spread his arms open wide and said, run back to me. When his son came back humbly, he said, put a ring on his finger. I love this. I love this, my boy. But yet we don't allow oftentimes the love of God to impact us. We still hide sin, refuse to acknowledge shortcomings. Times we refuse to honor God in in places of, whether it be business or, or private life, we shield those off. Those don't have to do with the love of Christ. They're my own pursuits. What areas of life do we attempt to withhold from his reach? He is a loving father and he can be trusted with everything. So to be filled with the fullness of God is that there is not one area of your life that the love of Christ should not touch and inform. We love, we give, we serve, we care because the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts. In sin, sorrow, pain, and disaster, he is our first recourse. We go to him with our fears. In Philippians 4, it talks about that. We go to him with our sins. Psalms 51 talks about that. We go to him... With our pain, Hebrews 4.15 talks about that. That the love of Christ should inform how we deal with our neighbors and our kids. How we love, how we give, how we forgive. He is our example in all of these things. That Christ has given us great love. He did not purpose just to tolerate us, but he promised to love us dearly forever. So this is... Those are the elements of what Paul is praying for, for us to understand the fullness of Christ's love that we can be filled with the fullness of God. So why does Paul pray? What does Paul pray? And now, why does Paul praise? Wouldn't you? Shouldn't we? If we begin to understand the love of Christ and what that means for our life, shouldn't we praise? 
In verse 20, he says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. That the experiential, when we experience God's love for us and we see it in our lives and we see life through that lens, that it leads us to say, oh my goodness, God does more than we could ever ask or think. He loves me more than I could ever comprehend. He cares more about me than I could ever process that he would organize all the circumstances of my life for my good. He loves us so much. He says to him, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. You know, the church, Pastor Ken's been preaching on for the last couple of weeks, this is a place where God has purposed to dwell. God has purposed to make his dwelling among us. This is a place where we share We tell of the glory of God. We share the stories of God. This is the place where we tell our kids about God. Our grandkids. That generation after generation, the church of God will continue. The Bible says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And that one day, every knee will bow before Christ. And the greater joy that we find in Christ's love, the more that we testify of our glorious God who is able to do far more than we ask or think. You know, in my reflection on the love of Christ this week, it it kind of led me to tell you the story of that bus girl who was invited to church and who the love of God was shared with, and it's, it's a marvelous story of the love of Christ poured out in a way that's beyond understanding. Somebody would sacrifice that much time for years to share the gospel with kids, but the rest of the story makes it far more impactful for me because that little girl went home and told her parents about the church, and the parents ended up bringing their three or four children to the church as well, and they actually enrolled in the school at the church, and they became regulars to everything. The father of the little girl, the eighth grader who was invited on the bus to church, God gifted him with an evangelistic zeal, and he would not stop until his brothers had heard the gospel repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly. One of his brothers said, it seemed like every time I was in a fight with my wife, Mike would come walking up the driveway. I'm like, oh my goodness, he's here to talk to me about God again. And God miraculously worked in that family. And you'd see all the names of the brothers and the parents on the prayer list each week at church, and then they would slowly lessen. Because Christ's love was shed abroad in the hearts of his brothers. They became followers of Christ, and with that, their kids. That young girl's grandparents became followers of Christ as well. And if my numbers are correct, there's roughly just shy of of 40 people that will be in church today as a direct result of this bus kid going to church. And among these 40 people Are my wife and kids who are watching online are here as a direct result, our followers of Christ as a direct result of this bus girl. She's my wife's sister. That when the love of Christ is shed abroad in somebody's heart, it's infectious. It's impactful. It's it's powerful. And if if you don't know the love of Christ here today. Can I implore you, can I encourage you to talk to somebody about that? To ask questions because there is nothing of greater value in the world than to possess Christ's 
love. There are people, as some have just testified all over here, who would testify of the beauty and the glory of what it means to know Christ. And so I would love to speak with you, or, or Pastor Ken, as he's around as well, and, and others, we would love to speak with you and talk to you about the beauty of what it means to know Christ. That you would just fall on your face before him. That you would ask for forgiveness and trust in Christ to save you. If you are a follower of Christ today, I pray that this would be a reminder to you of the beauty of what we have in Christ's love. Sometimes we can grow cold to this. And if even today you still find yourself as a little cold to this. I've been there and am there more than I'd like to be. Can I encourage you to pray this prayer for yourself, to, to talk with others. Let that alarm you a little bit, that your heart would grow cold to the love of Christ. Pray for him and trust him and he will warm it again. He will revive you with the beauty of what it means to know Christ. And perhaps your conversations over dinner, your time together this evening to reflect on the love of Christ, to tell the stories of what Christ has done for you, to share that with your children, to share that with the people you know and love. It's in those moments when we best understand, when we best appreciate, when we almost have that chill down the back of our spine that, that God would love us. It's, it's in those moments when we share that love with others, when we give and we serve and we love with others that we're experiencing the fullness of what it means to know God. We don't want to grow cold in that. We want to pursue that. We want to run after the love of Christ. Paul says it this way in another passage. As I seek to apprehend that which I'm apprehended by. As we seek to, to know and to understand and to lean into what it means to know the love of Christ we will find that the love of Christ has been apprehending us all along.